Part five of the Old English Baron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Old English Baron, a Gothic story by Clara Reeve. Part five. This happened, said she, as I told you on the twenty first. On the morrow, my Andrew went out early to work along with one Robin Rouse, our neighbor. They had not been gone over an hour when they both came back seemingly very much frightened. Says Andrew, Go you, Robin, and borrow a pickaxe at neighbor Stiles. What is the matter now? said I. Matter enough, quoth Andrew. We may come to be hanged, perhaps, as many an innocent man has before us. Tell me what is the matter, said I. I will, said he, but if ever you open your mouth about it, woe be to you. I never will, said I but he made me swear by all the blessed saints in the calendar, and then he told me that, as Robin and he were going over the footbridge, where he found the child the evening before, they saw something floating upon the water, so they followed it till it stuck against a stake, and found it to be the dead body of a woman. As sure as you are alive, Madge, he said, this was the mother of the child I brought home. Merciful God, said Edmund, am I the child of that hapless mother? "'Be composed,' said Oswald. "'Proceed, good woman. The time is precious.' "'And so,' continued she, "'Andrew told me they dragged the body out of the river, "'and it was richly dressed, and must be somebody of consequence. "'I suppose,' said he, "'when the poor lady had taken care of her child, "'she went to find some help, "'and, the night being dark, her foot slipped, "'and she fell into the river and was drowned. "'Lord have mercy,' said Robin. "'What shall we do with the dead body? "'We may be taken up for the murder.' What had we to do to meddle with it? Ay, but, says Andrew, we must have something to do with it now, and our wisest way is to bury it. Robin was sadly frightened, but at last they agreed to carry it into the wood and bury it there. So they came home for the pickaxe and shovel. Well, said I, Andrew, but will you bury all the rich clothes you speak of? Why, said he, it would be both a sin and a shame to strip the dead. So it would, said I but I will give you a sheet to wrap the body in, and you may take off her upper garments, and anything of value, but do not strip her to the skin for anything. Well said, wench, said he, I will do as you say. So I fetched a sheet, and by that time Robin was come back, and away they went together. They did not come back again till noon, and then they sat down and ate a morsel together, says Andrew. Now we may sit down and eat in peace. I, says Robin, and sleep in peace, too, for we have done no harm. No, to be sure, said I, but yet I am much concerned that the poor lady had not Christian burial. Never trouble thyself about that, said Andrew. We have done the best we could for her, but let us see what we have got in our bags. We must divide them. So they opened their bags and took out a fine gown and a pair of rich shoes, but, besides these, there was a fine necklace with a golden locket and a pair of earrings says Andrew, and winked at me. I will have these, and you may take the rest. Robin said he was satisfied, and so he went his way. When he was gone, Here, you fool, says Andrew, take these and keep them as safe as the bud of your eye. If ever young master is found, these will make our fortune. And have you them now? said Oswald. Yes, that I have, answered she. Andrew would have sold them long ago, but I always put him off it. "'Heaven be praised,' said Edmund. "'Hush,' said Oswald. "'Let us not lose time. Proceed, goody.' "'Nay,' said Marjorie, "'I have not much more to say. "'We looked every day to hear some inquiries after the child, "'but nothing passed. Nobody was missing.' "'Did nobody of note die about that time?' said Oswald. "'Why, yes,' said Marjorie. "'The widow Lady Lovell died that same week. "'By the same token, Andrew went to the funeral "'and brought home a suchin which I keep unto this day. Very well, go on. My husband behaved well enough to the boy, till such time as he had two or three children of his own, and then he began to grumble and say it was hard to maintain other folks' children, when he found it hard enough to keep his own. I loved the boy quite as well as my own. Often and often I have pacified Andrew, and made him to hope that he should one day or other be paid for his trouble, but at last he grew out of patience, and gave over all hopes of that kind. As Edmund grew up, he grew sickly and tender, and could not bear hard labor. And that was another reason why my husband could not bear with him. If, quoth he, the boy could earn his living, I did not care, but I must bear all the expense. 
There came an old pilgrim into our parts. He was a scholar, and had been a soldier, and he taught Edmund to read, and then he told him histories of wars, and knights, and lords, and great men, and Edmund took such delight in hearing him that he would not take to anything else. To be sure, Edwin was a pleasant companion. He would tell old stories and sing old songs that one could have sat all night to hear him. But, as I was saying, Edmund grew more and more fond of reading and less of work. However, he would run of errands and do many handy turns for the neighbors, and he was so courteous a lad that people took notice of him. Andrew once catched him alone reading, and then told him that if he did not find some way to earn his bread, he would turn him out of doors in a very short time and so he would have done, sure enough, if my lord Fitzowen had not taken him into his service just in the neck. "'Very well, Goody,' said Oswald. "'You have told your story very well. I am glad, for Edmund's sake, that you can do it so properly. But now, can you keep a secret?' "'Why, and to please your reverence, I think I have showed you that I can. But can you keep it from your husband?' "'Aye,' said she, "'surely I can, for I dare not tell him.' "'That is a good security,' said he, "'but I must have better. "'You must swear upon this book not to disclose "'anything that has passed between us three, "'till we desire you to do it. "'Be assured you will soon be called upon for this purpose. "'Edmund's birth is mere discovery. "'He is the son of parents of high degree, "'and it will be in his power to make your fortune "'when he takes possession of his own.' "'Holy Virgin, what is it you tell me? "'How you rejoice me to hear "'that what I have so long prayed for will come to pass!' She took the oath required, saying it after Oswald. Now, said he, go and fetch the tokens you have mentioned. When she was gone, Edmund's passions, long suppressed, broke out in tears and exclamations. He kneeled down, and with his hands clasped together, returned thanks to heaven for the discovery. Oswald begged him to be composed, lest Marjorie should perceive his agitation and misconstrue the cause. She soon returned with the necklace and earrings. They were pearls of great value, and the necklace had a locket on which the cipher of Lovell was engraved. This, said Oswald, is indeed proof of consequence. Keep it, sir, for it belongs to you. Must he take it away? said she. Certainly, returned Oswald. We can do nothing without it. But if Andrew should ask for it, you must put him off for the present, and hereafter he will find his account in it. Marjorie consented reluctantly to part with the jewels and after some further conversation they took leave of her. Edmund embraced her affectionately. "'I thank you with my whole heart,' said he, "'for all your goodness to me. Though I confess, I never felt much regard for your husband, yet for you I had always the tender affection of a son. You will, I trust, give your evidence in my behalf when called upon, and I hope it will one day be in my power to reward your kindness. In that case, I will own you as my foster-mother, and you shall always be treated as such.' Marjorie wept. The Lord grant it, said she, and I pray him to have you in his holy keeping. Farewell, my dear child. Oswald desired them to separate for fear of intrusion, and they returned to the castle. Marjorie stood at the door of her cottage, looking every way to see if the coast was clear. Now, sir, said Oswald, I congratulate you as the son of Lord and Lady Lovell. The proofs are strong and indisputable. "'To us they are so,' said Edmund. "'But how shall we make them so to others? "'And what are we to think of the funeral of Lady Lovell?' "'As of a fiction,' said Oswald, "'the work of the present lord, "'to secure his title and fortune.' "'And by what means can we use to dispossess him?' said Edmund. "'He is not a man for a poor youth like me to contend with.' "'Doubt not,' said Oswald, but heaven, who has evidently conducted you by the hand thus far, will complete its own work. For my part, I can only wonder and adore. Give me your advice, then, said Edmund, for heaven assists us by natural means. It seems to me, said Oswald, that your first step must be to make a friend of some great man of consequence enough to espouse your cause, and to get this affair examined into by authority. Edmund started and crossed himself. He suddenly exclaimed, "'A friend! Yes, I have a friend! A powerful one, too, one sent by heaven to be my protector, but whom I have too long neglected.' "'Who can that be?' said Oswald. "'Who should it be?' said Edmund. "'But that good Sir Philip Harclay, the chosen friend of him, 
whom I shall from henceforth call my father. "'Tis true indeed, said Oswald, and this is a fresh proof of what I before observed, that heaven assists you, and will complete its own work. I think so myself, said Edmund, and rely upon its direction. I have already determined on my future conduct, which I will communicate to you. My first step shall be to leave the castle. My lord has this day given me a horse, upon which I purpose to set out this very night, without the knowledge of any of the family. I will go to Sir Philip Harclay. I will throw myself at his feet, relate my strange story, and implore his protection. With him I will consult on the most proper way of bringing this murderer to public justice, and I will be guided by his advice and direction in everything. Nothing can be better, said Oswald, than what you propose, but give me leave to offer an addition to your scheme. You shall set off in the dead of night, as you intend. Joseph and I will favor your departure in such a manner as to throw mystery over the circumstances of it. Your disappearing at such a time from the haunted apartment will terrify and confound all the family. They will puzzle themselves in vain to account for it, and they will be afraid to pry into the secrets of that place. You say well, and I approve your addition, replied Edmund. Suppose, likewise, there was a letter written in a mysterious manner, and dropped in my lord's way, or sent to him afterwards. It would forward our design, and frighten them away from that apartment. That shall be my care, said Oswald, and I will warn to you that they will not find themselves disposed to inhabit it presently. But how shall I leave my dear friend, Mr. William, without a word of notice of this separation? I have thought of that, too, said Oswald and I will so manage as to acquaint him with it in such a manner as he shall think out of the common course of things, and which shall make him wonder and be silent. How will you do that? said Edmund. I will tell you hereafter, said Oswald, for here comes old Joseph to meet us. He came indeed as fast as his age would permit him. As soon as he was within hearing he asked them what news. They related all that had passed at Twyford's cottage. He heard them with the greatest earnestness of attention, and as soon as they came to the great event, "'I knew it! I knew it!' exclaimed Joseph. "'I was sure it would prove so. Thank God for it. But I will be the first to acknowledge my young lord, and I will live and die his faithful servant.' Here Joseph attempted to kneel to him, but Edmund prevented him with a warm embrace. "'My friend, my dear friend,' said he, I cannot suffer a man of your age to kneel to me. Are you not one of my best and truest friends? I will ever remember your disinterested affection for me, and if heaven restores me to my rights, it shall be one of my first cares to render your old age easy and happy. Joseph wept over him, and it was some time before he could utter a word. Oswald gave both of them time to recover their emotion by acquainting Joseph with Edmund's scheme for his departure. Joseph wiped his eyes and spoke. "'I have thought,' said he, "'of something that will be both agree and useful to my dear master. John Wyatt, Sir Philip Harclay's servant, is now upon a visit at his father's. I have heard that he goes home soon. Now he would be both a guide and companion on the way.' "'That is indeed a happy circumstance,' said Edmund. "'But how shall we know certainly the time of his departure?' "'Why, sir, I will go to him and inquire." and bring you word directly. Do so, said Edmund, and you will oblige me greatly. But, sir, said Oswald, I think it would be best not to let John Wyatt know who is to be his companion. Only let Joseph tell him that a gentleman is going to visit his master, and, if possible, prevail upon him to set out this night. Do so, my good friend, said Edmund, and tell him further that this person has business of great consequence to communicate to his master, and cannot delay his journey on any account. "'I will do this, you may depend,' said Joseph, "'and acquaint you with my success as soon as possible. But, sir, you must not go without a guide, at any rate.' "'I trust I shall not,' said Edmund, "'though I go alone. He that has received such a call as I have can want no other, nor fear any danger.' They conversed upon these points till they drew near the castle, when Joseph left them to go on his errand, and Edmund attended his lord at dinner. The baron observed that he was silent and reserved. The conversation languished on both sides. As soon as dinner was ended, 
Edmund asked permission to go up into his own apartment, where he packed up some necessaries and made a hasty preparation for his departure. Afterwards he walked into the garden, revolving in his mind the peculiarity of his situation and the uncertainty of his future prospects. Lost in thought, he walked to and fro in a covered walk, with his arms crossed and his eyes cast down, without perceiving that he was observed by two females who stood at a distance watching his motions. It was the Lady Emma and her attendant who were thus engaged. At length he lifted up his eyes and saw them. He stood still, and was irresolute whether to advance or retire. They approached him, and, as they drew near, fair Emma spoke. "'You have been so rapt in meditation, Edmund, that I am apprehensive of some new vexation that I am yet a stranger to. Would it were in my power to lessen those you have already? But tell me if I guess truly?' He stood still irresolute. He answered with hesitation, "'O oh, lady, I am... I am grieved. I am concerned to be the cause of so much confusion in this noble family, to which I am so much indebted. I see no way to lessen these evils but to remove the cause of them. Meaning yourself, said she. Certainly, madam, and I was meditating on my departure. But, said she, by your departure you will not remove the cause. How so, madam? Because you are not the cause, but those you will leave behind you. Lady Emma, how can you affect this ignorance, Edmund? You know well enough it is that odious Wenlock, your enemy and my aversion, that has caused all this mischief among us, and will much more if he is not removed. This, madam, is a subject that becomes me to be silent upon. Mr. Wenlock is your kinsman. He is not my friend, and for that reason I ought not to speak against him, nor you to hear it from me. If he has used me ill, I am recompensed by the generous treatment of my lord your father, who is all that is great and good. He has allowed me to justify myself to him, and he has restored me to his good opinion, which I prize among the best gifts of heaven. Your amiable brother William thinks well of me, and his esteem is infinitely dear to me. And you, excellent lady, permit me to hope that you honor me with your good opinion." Are not these ample amends for the ill-will Mr. Wenlock bears me? My opinion of you, Edmund, said she, is fixed and settled. It is not founded upon events of yesterday, but upon long knowledge and experience, upon your whole conduct and character. You honor me, lady. Continue to think well of me. It will excite me to deserve it. When I am far distant from this place, the remembrance of your goodness will be a cordial to my heart." "'But why will you leave us, Edmund? Stay and defeat the designs of your enemy. You shall have my wishes and assistance.' "'Pardon me, madam. That is among the things I cannot do, even if it were in my power, which it is not. Mr. Wenlock loves you, lady, and if he is so unhappy as to be your aversion, that is a punishment severe enough. But for the rest, I may be unfortunate by the wickedness of others, but if I am unworthy, it must be my own fault. So then, you think it is an unworthy action to oppose Mr. Wenlock? Very well, sir. Then I suppose you wish him success. You wish that I may be married to him? I, madam, said Edmund, confused, what am I that I should give my opinion on an affair of so much consequence? You distress me by the question. May you be happy. May you enjoy your own wishes. He sighed. He turned away. She called him back. He trembled and kept silence. She seemed to enjoy his confusion. She was cruel enough to repeat the question. Tell me, Edmund, and truly, do you wish to see me give my hand to Wenlock? I insist upon your answer. All on a sudden he recovered both his voice and courage. He stepped forward, his person erect, his countenance assured, his voice resolute and intrepid. Since Lady Emma insists upon my answer, since she avows a dislike to Wenlock, since she condescends to ask my opinion, I will tell her my thoughts, my wishes. The fair Emma now trembled in her turn. She blushed, looked down, and was ashamed to have spoken so freely. Edmund went on. My most ardent wishes are that the fair Emma may reserve her heart and hand till a certain person, a friend of mine, 
is at liberty to solicit them, whose utmost ambition is first to deserve, and then to obtain them. "'Your friend, sir,' said Lady Emma, her brow clouded, her eye disdainful. Edmund proceeded. "'My friend is so particularly circumstanced that he cannot at present with propriety ask for Lady Emma's favour, but as soon as he has gained a cause that is yet in suspense, he will openly declare his pretensions, and if he is unsuccessful, he will then condemn himself to eternal silence.' Lady Emma knew not what to think of this declaration. She hoped, she feared, she meditated, but her attention was too strongly excited to be satisfied without some gratification. After a pause she pursued the subject. "'And this friend of yours, sir, of what degree and fortune is he?' Edmund smiled, but commanding his emotion, he replied, "'His birth is noble, his degree and fortune uncertain.' Her countenance fell. She sighed as he proceeded. It is utterly impossible, said he, for any man of inferior degree to aspire to Lady Emma's favour. Her noble birth, the dignity of her beauty and virtues, must awe and keep at their proper distance all men of inferior degree and merit. They may admire, they may revere, but they must not presume to approach too near, lest their presumption should meet with its punishment. Well, sir, she said suddenly, and so this friend of yours has commissioned you to speak in his behalf? He has, madam. Then I must tell you that I think his assurance is very great, and yours not much less. I am sorry for that, madam. Tell him that I shall reserve my heart and hand for the man to whom my father shall bid me give them. Very well, lady. I am certain my lord loves you too well to dispose of them against your inclination. How do you know that, sir? But tell him— that the man that hopes for my favour must apply to my lord for his. That is my friend's intention, his resolution, I should say, as soon as he can do it with propriety, and I accept your permission for him to do so. My permission, did you say? I am astonished at your assurance. Tell me no more of your friend. But perhaps you are pleading for Wenlock all this time. It is all one to me. Only say no more. Are you offended with me, madam? No matter, sir. Yes, it is. I am surprised at you, Edmund. I am surprised at my own temerity, but forgive me. It does not signify. Good-bye to you, sir. Don't leave me in anger, madam. I cannot bear that. Perhaps I may not see you again for a long time. He looked afflicted. She turned back. I do forgive you, Edmund. I was concerned for you, but, it seems, you are more concerned for everybody than for yourself. She sighed. Farewell, said she. Edmund gazed on her with tenderness. He approached her. He just touched her hand. His heart was rising to his lips, but he recollected his situation. He checked himself immediately. He retired back. He sighed deeply, bowed low, and hastily quitted her. The lady turning into another walk, he reached the house first, and went up again to his chamber. He threw himself upon his knees, prayed for a thousand blessings upon every one of the family of his benefactor, and involuntarily wept at mentioning the name of the charming Emma, whom he was about to leave abruptly, and perhaps for ever. He then endeavoured to compose himself, and once more attended the baron, wished him a good night, and withdrew to his chamber, till he was called upon to go again into the haunted apartment. End of Part 5 Recording by Mary Ann Spiegel in Chicago, Illinois, August 18, 2009.